As we're working on installing a video system in the church building to film services in the coming months when we can no longer meet outside, I'm going to be transitioning to only putting videos out on the weeks that I preach at church. So this will be my last video for the month, but expect another in September. I'd like to begin with some words for reflection from the message translation of the Bible, John chapter 1, verse 14. The Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. God, through Jesus, came to earth and moved into the neighborhood. I started this week by asking a question. Two Sundays ago, I spoke about community, and there is a reason why that very word is a part of our church name. We are the Eel River Community Church of the Brethren. Why? I discovered that since 1838, the congregation that met in this building was the Eel River Church of the Brethren. Then, many of you probably know or may even remember, 20 years ago in the year 2000, the South Creek Church of the Brethren merged with the Eel River Church of the Brethren and decided to be known as the Eel River Community Church of the Brethren. Then in 2007, the West Manchester Church of the Brethren merged as well, validating that new name. So the Eel River Church became a community by reaching out, by not being afraid to grow, by being welcoming and gracious to neighboring churches and people. We have a history of acting as Jesus in the neighborhood. We even have current ministries like giving the vegetables from our church garden to the food pantry and service projects and mission trips that are meaningful relationships with our neighbors outside of the church. Many of you have probably heard by now that the grocery store is no longer named New Market. Its new name is Neighborhood Fresh. The name is the only thing that changed. Same building, same food, same prices, same people that work there. For the grocery store, that may be a good thing. Customers can rest assured that the name is the only thing they have to worry about losing. For the church, there is a danger in surface changes. For example, if my sermon title sounds familiar, Jesus in the Neighborhood, you might recognize it as the shortened version of the Church of the Brethren's compelling vision statement that the delegates, including our own Nathan Sauter, focused on helping to create at the 2019 annual conference. We have a new compelling vision statement, but if we don't act on it, if we don't live it out, if it changes nothing, the vision we have for the future of what our church could be will not come true. Now, living out Jesus in the neighborhood does not have to mean preaching and praying and singing hymns at all places at all times although certainly if you're feeling called to. It means living out that community of faith that loves and supports one another and is open to differences and has each other's best interests at heart, not only when we are at church, but with everyone we meet. We cannot only feel each other's pain during the joys and concerns time at church and ignore the pain of others every other day. We can put so much work into our church and make it a safe and positive environment for us to come and worship and feel uplifted by each other and by God. But if we are not also reaching out to the world around us, if we are missing it or hurrying past and purposely not paying attention, there will be no Jesus in the neighborhood. There will be only Jesus tucked away and hidden from our neighbors. Again, I'm not saying call all the numbers in the phone book, but if we're being aware of members of God's church, there will be opportunities to act as Jesus would. As an example, Jake's favorite restaurant is Kim Vu Vietnamese cuisine in Fort Wayne. He goes at least once a week for a bowl of pho soup. Over several years of him going there, the owner has learned his preferences and order down to the last detail. When we go, he doesn't even give us a menu anymore. He has learned that Jake likes extra meatballs in his soup and extra limes on the side. If I go with Jake, he'll ask if we want the soup split into two bowls. Jake likes the flavor of the onions in his soup, but he doesn't always want to eat them. 
So we started taking them out of the bowl and setting them on the side dish while he ate. The following time we went in, Jake asked for his usual, and the owner asked if he would rather not have onions in it. Jake hadn't even mentioned it. The owner noticed when clearing the dishes that Jake had taken the onions out and had remembered to ask for the next time he was there. It meant a lot to us, and it was just a simple gesture on his part, but it meant he was paying attention and he cared. I don't know the owner's religion, but it felt to me like he was acting as Jesus in that neighborhood. Eugene Peterson once gave this analogy. Imagine a young man starting off on a two-mile walk across town to see a girl. Seeing her and spending the evening with her is the purpose and goal of his walk. She's very much alive in his imagination. He can't keep her out of his mind. Passing a delicatessen, he remembers her favorite candy and buys a box. Passing a flower shop, he's inspired with the thought of how lovely she would look with flowers on her shoulder, so he buys a corsage. Passing old acquaintances, he entirely misses even seeing them. Passing a church, he looks particularly long at it, for he once heard her remark that that was where she would like to be married. Nearing her home, he glances at his reflection in a store window, straightens his tie, and fixes his hat. By the time he arrives at her door, we will have been able to list at least a dozen specific actions in the course of the two-mile walk, all caused by the girl and his imagination. She was in his conduct. We could all probably think of a similar example, where something or someone was so important to us that they dictated our actions and decisions. Putting God in that position is how we become Jesus in the neighborhood, by keeping Christ in our conduct. Our main scripture focus for this morning is from the book of Colossians chapter 1, starting with verses 3 through 8, taken from Paul's letter to the church, which reads, We will always thank God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. The line that stood out to me from that passage was the fifth verse. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven. The message translation reads, The lines of purpose in your lives never grow slack. Tightly tied as they are to your future in heaven, kept taut by hope. So if we ever feel lost or like what we may be doing is pointless, there is this line from us to heaven, a line of purpose so that we are never too far off from God's path, that we are all drawn toward. I imagine it as a wide path, large enough to fit everyone if they choose to hold on to their line. And the line is kept taut by hope. That hope connecting us all to God and to each other, then, as Paul says in his letter to the Colossians, produces faith in Christ Jesus and love for all God's people. The text passage from Colossians continues with verses 9 through 12. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. Paul prays for endurance or fortitude 
patience, and joy for the Christians of Colossians. Experts on the earlier translations tell us the Greek word hupomone is translated patience in the authorized version, but it does not mean patience in the sense of simply bowing the head and letting the tide of events flow over one. It means not only the ability to bear things, but the ability in bearing them to turn them into glory. It is a conquering patience. Hupomone is the ability to deal triumphantly with anything that life can do to us. The Greek word makrothumia is usually translated long-suffering in the authorized version. Its basic meaning is patience with people. It's the quality of mind and heart which enables a man so to bear with people that the unpleasantness and maliciousness and cruelty will never drive him to bitterness that their unteachableness will never drive him to despair, that their folly will never drive him to irritation, that their unloveliness will never alter his love. Macrothumia is the spirit which never loses patience in, belief in, and hope for mankind. So Paul prays for Hupomone, the fortitude which no situation can defeat, and Macrothumia, the patience which no person can defeat. He prays that the Christian may be such that no circumstances will defeat his strength and no human being defeat his love. I read an article this past week about couples who have had lasting relationships offering their advice on marriage. One couple's words stood out to me. They said they had yet to figure out how to solve a problem in their marriage. Instead, the only solution they had found to work time and again was to focus on fixing their own personal problems, then to present themselves to one another as better versions of themselves. As Christians and believers in the power and love of God, we are called to show love to our neighbors and even more so, We are called to ask ourselves if we are the best versions of ourselves. If we are living out a life as Jesus did, helping others, healing others, holding others in prayer, we will have a hard time solving the problems we see in the world. And we will have a hard time reaching our neighbors if we as imperfect humans force our beliefs on them. Who is your best self? You have to start living that way. And that doesn't mean you'll be perfect. But if you always have it in the back of your mind, I want to be the best person I can to all people. I want to make every moment count. You'll be acting as Jesus did. If you start living that way, Christ will show up in your conduct. Jesus will move into this neighborhood. It may not be easy. Jesus was his best self, and it wasn't enough for people. They crucified him. That's a burden we all share as well, except when Jesus died on the cross, he was showing the world that God knows and God forgives. We are made in God's image, so let's act like it. And through our actions, God will work in this world, and God will work through this church. What are you going to do this week to show your belief through action? What are you going to do this week to show your trust in God by simply living as Jesus did, with dedication that cannot be defeated and love that is stronger than all hate? Please pray with me. Dear God, Thank you for all you have given us. Lead us to be blessings in the lives of others. In your name we pray. Amen.